My talk is called Mastering the Vim Language, which is an extremely lofty title that I will probably not live up to, but I'm going to give it my best. Uh, so Vim is an extremely interesting editor. It's one of, frankly, the two very interesting editors, and we're going to hear about both tonight. How exciting. Uh, this talk is going to be about my recent, probably over the past year, kind of focus on what really does make Vim unique, what makes it special, and how can I get better at using those features. So a quick introduction to me for anyone that doesn't know me. My name is Chris Toomey. I work here at ThoughtBot. Uh, they're kind enough to provide the pizza and space and beer and friendship, so all good things. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Chris Toomey, and I'm at a blog as ctoomey.com. So you can find me at any of those places, and uh, happy to chat with you about anything. So I love Vim. This is something that you could probably guess about me as someone who runs a Vim meetup. Uh, but I really do. Uh, it's by far my favorite tool that I use, and it's also the tool that I use the most. Uh, there are many features of it that I love, many things that make me happy when I use it. But one of the core pieces is that over the many years that I've used it, I've, I've yet to hit the ceiling. I've yet to find that edge where, you know what, I, I've learned it. I got it all. Uh, that's definitely not something that's happened. And in fact, I've met no one that I can think of that has found that edge, that has said, like, I've got it. I know all of them. Uh, and so this might seem like something that's actually not great, that's kind of a negative, uh, but to me, since this is the tool that I use most every single day, I love that I can constantly sharpen that saw, I can constantly get better at it, I can adapt myself or the editor better to my workflows. Uh, I don't want something that has a ceiling, frankly, I want to keep getting better at it, uh, and Vim definitely delivers on that front. Uh, and I think this is actually really important and somewhat undervalued. Uh, a lot of people talk about how fast you can be in Vim. Uh, but for me, it's not really about speed. Speed's nice. It's a benefit that I do get from using Vim, but it's not the key reason that I use it. I use Vim because I don't have to think. Uh, in fact, a lot of people reference this quote. Uh, it's not actually related to Vim, the original quote, but typing is not the bottleneck. Uh, and so they're talking about, well, you know what, sure, you can be fast in Vim, but that doesn't really matter. Typing's not the bottleneck. The original reference, this typing uh, is not the bottleneck quote, is related to TDD, but I do hear it sometimes used as an argument as to why, like, eh, Vim's probably not worth it. And I agree. Uh, the speed alone is not a reason to use an editor. But the corollary to typing is not a bottleneck I think is actually really interesting. Uh, thinking is the bottleneck. That time I spend not typing uh, that time I spend thinking is the most important. And I'm limited in two ways. I'm limited in time related to that. Like it, it just takes some time to think. But more importantly to me, I have a limited amount of thinking that I've found to be useful within a given day. I only have so many units of thought that I can put out into the world. And frankly, I want to spend zero of them on my editor. And that's why I love Vim. Vim gives me a language to express the changes that I want to make in the most concise, efficient, and easy to interface with way that I've ever found. Uh, I don't speak Vim's language, Vim speaks my language. And that means that I don't have to think about it. I kind of just put my hands on the keyboard after I figured out the change I want to make, and it happens. Uh, and that's kind of magical, but it's also really practical in that I'm not wasting any thought cycles on telling the editor what to do. <clears throat> so Vim's killer feature is the language that it provides for defining changes. Uh, so just as a quick introduction to this general concept, most editors, as you type on the keyboard, it's going to literally enter the character that you typed into the document that you're editing. Uh, it treats that inserting of text as the primary action. Uh, Vim spins this on its head and says, actually, most of the time, especially as programmers, but even generally as writers, we're editing. We're not writing. We are going through and we're changing text that already exists. So Vim chose to optimize for editing text, and I believe that that was a very good choice. Uh, it gives you a whole language to express the changes that you want to make very concisely, repeatably, undoably. Uh, it has all of these wonderful features that fall out of treating changing text as the primary concern. So let's break this down and get a, a little more practical. Uh, the syntax of the language is broken down into verbs and nouns, uh, operations and text that you want to operate on. So for instance, we have a, a very simple example here. D in Vim, thank you, let's pull this over here too. Uh, D in Vim will delete, but it's going to wait until you tell it what to delete. W is for word. So D, W, typed in sequence, will delete a word. And again, just to keep this 
nice and practical. I have a sample document here, and if I happen to be at the beginning of the word initialize, DW will delete that word. That's a nice little party trick on its own, but it does demonstrate the core of the language. We have operations and we have the text that we want to change. So we'll undo that here. We can come back to the idea. Uh, so let's talk about this at a little bit higher of a level. We'll break it down into the two sides, the verbs and the nouns. <clears throat> Uh, so actually, before we go into that, I do want to talk about the idea that these commands that you give Vim, a command being a combination of an operator and a noun, have these really great features that they're both repeatable and undoable. So if I come back into this document, I made that change here to delete a word. And now, if I move around, I can go anywhere else in this document, and by typing dot, Vim remembers the last change that I made, which happened to be delete a word. And I can use this anywhere I want any word that I find in the document, I can repeat that change. And that change, again, is that combination of the operation and the noun. Uh, even better, I can undo these. And you'll note that when I undo them, they undo as these atomic operations. It's not individual characters that are being restored, but it's the entire word. It's that distinct change that I made that I can now undo. So I can define a change, and then I can kind of stamp that out through the document, repeating it as necessary and very directly undo it in the exact way that I did it. Uh, this is extremely powerful, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on and how you can leverage this, uh, but those are really important characteristics of the language that Vim provides. So coming back to the syntax of the language, again, we start with verbs. This is the operation that you want to make. Uh, so here I've got a sample of them. There are more than these, but just to focus in on a few, uh, D will delete. And again, that's going to wait for what you want to operate on. Uh, C will change, which is delete and get ready to insert and type in new text. Uh, the greater than symbol is going to indent. The less than, as the corollary, will outdent. V will visually select, so it will actually highlight a portion of text. And Y will yank. So to give, again, a couple practical examples here, uh, we've already done DW. That will delete a word. But now CW puts me into insert mode, and I can say hello. Now again. We've got that repeatability feature. So if I come here and I hit dot, I've now repeated that change, which also includes adding the word hello. Uh, and again, the undo covers all of that. So this is, again, this very expressive language that captures all of these different features. Uh, similarly, uh, this doesn't work so well for a word, so I'll use a different motion here. But if I say indent greater than and then j to go down, it will indent the current line and the line below the motion that I just described. Uh, similarly, if I yank a word here, then I can paste that word. So yank is to copy in Vim. Uh, so we have all of these different things that operate with those same nouns, but are different operations. So those are the core. That's where we start from. And now we can move on to the motions. This is where things get very interesting and kind of expand in possibility very quickly. Uh, so we've already covered W for word. Uh, B is the reverse of that. You can go back. 2J, I just demonstrated to go down. So what's great about this is every motion, everything that you use to move around in a document in Vim, also acts as a way to operate on it, to make a change. So the same thing that would move me a certain distance, I can now change over that. I can yank over that. Uh, I can operate on the same bodies of text that I can define with all those motions. So once you know the one, you automatically know the other. Uh, this is great, but it is a little bit limited. What if you happen to be in the middle of some text that you want to operate on? This is where things get very interesting. Uh, we get text objects. And text objects allow you to operate from anywhere within a defined body of text. So for instance, IW in sequence will define inner word, which will operate anywhere within a word, but on that whole word. IT similarly is inner tag. So for HTML, XML, et cetera type tags. I quote for inside the quotes, IP for inner paragraph, etc. So here we can give a quick demonstration. Uh, I'll go over here so that I'm inside of these single quotes, and I'll start, uh, I'll demonstrate kind of a few successive things. So DIW is going to delete the word that I'm on. DI quote inside the quotes. DI bracket inside the brackets. DI paren inside the parens. And DIP dip, which is always fun to say. Uh, inside the paragraph. Uh, what's great is there's not a lot to remember there, actually. Uh, those come to me very easily. When I'm looking at the text, I see quotes, and I know I want to operate inside those quotes. 
So it's D, I, quote. I almost don't remember anything about that. That just happens. That just falls out of my fingers, which is amazing to me. Uh, and so each of these, again, have that same wonderful repeatability. So if I happen to be here inside of the word result, I can say change inner word, type out hello as what I want to change to. And now I can be on an entirely different word. But because Vim has an understanding of word, what that means, dot will repeat that change. Exactly what I want to do, change this word that I'm currently on into hello. Uh, this gets even more interesting if I go over to a sample using some HTML. So here we have uh, some structured HTML. And Vim, again, has an understanding. It has a text object to describe this HTML. I happen to be on a P tag here, a paragraph tag. And I can say change inner tag, C-I-T. And again, I'll use that same repeat that I actually, sorry, I missed that there. C-I-T, hello, and hit escape. And now I can repeat that on any of the other tags. That's an li tag, not a p tag. But again, I said change inner tag, not change inner p tag. So Vim knows what I mean. Uh, and tags are actually especially interesting because here you can see my cursor is on the close tag. My cursor is not even really inside the tag. But Vim still knows a tag is defined by this whole structure. And inside the tag is still that text that's in there. So even though I'm on the close tag, or in this case, I'll go over to the open tag, I can still repeat that change. And I can move up here. If I'm on ul hello, I can change that. So Vim, again, gives me this very expressive language for defining and repeating these changes that is uh, surprisingly well suited to exactly how I think about these changes. <clears throat> so these are text objects. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, I highly suggest looking into them. I remember the day that I learned inner word, and it was just this kind of mind-expanding experience. I was like, oh, OK, well, I'm using Vim for the rest of my life. That's clear. Uh, it, was, it was a good day. It was a very good day. Uh, so now we get to what I think are kind of the most interesting of uh, the nouns that we can use. These are parameterized text objects. I don't know that they're actually called that. I needed a word, so I chose that word to describe them. Um, but what I mean by that is the text object alone is not complete. It needs more. Uh, you need to target something. So f finds, and it can find any character. So I can f a, and that will find the next occurrence of a. Uh, t is similar, but it goes up to, but not including that character. And similarly, I can use search as a text object. So I'll demonstrate that here. Uh, if I want to change everything up to the L in list, I can target that by saying C, T, big L. C, T, big L, and now I can type out hello. So I'm able to target that uniquely. There are other ones that would work there, but uh, that one is special in that it lets me target basically anything. So here, for instance, there's a lot of stuff in the way. Words won't work, inner words won't work. But if I want to go out to the one, I can say change F single quote. So find all the way up to the single quote. And now I'm right up next to the single quote and one. And again, this has the benefit that I can repeat all of these. So as a great example uh, of this, I can use searching. So I can use searching to define the text I want to operate on uh, and then repeat that. So for instance, here I have the word other all the way out there in that second quoted string within the brackets, uh, within all sorts of other things. So I really don't have another way to get there. Uh, F-O is unfortunately not going to get me there because there's a one in the way. F single quote, not going to get me there. Uh, F comma gets me close, but still not quite there. Uh, but if I search, I can find other. Luckily, Vim recognizes that that's a useful way to get around. So I can say change search, search being the slash character. Type out other, and you can see it's actually progressively highlighting for me. Uh, so I don't even have to quickly get this. I can progressively type this out, see what it's finding. So for instance, if I just type O, it's going to find that first one. But the minute I type the T, it knows to target out to other. Hit Enter there, and then hello, and I'll close the quote again. And now, once again, this has the benefit that this is repeatable. So if I hit dot here, it repeats that up to that same search pattern. So thinking about this, each of F, T, and then they both have a capital version. Big F goes backwards, big T goes backwards. Uh, search and question mark, which is the reverse of search, go in the other direction. Uh, all of those 
work on any of the characters that are available, or in the case of search, literally anything you type in, which is basically infinity. So that's a lot. Uh, so in preparation for this talk, I decided to do a little bit of math uh, and figure out just roughly what are we talking about here? How many different things can I define? So we've got five operators. That's actually very uh, conservative. There's more operators than that. Uh, some 10-ish motions. Uh, I've shown a bunch of those already. There's more than that. Similarly, text objects, inner paragraph, inner word, uh, all of the FFTT motions times 35, maybe 70 characters, depending on how you count it, uh, all the uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, punctuation. And lastly, let's call it 100 for search, which is totally not accurate, because you can search for just about anything. But just taking these, we have 2,000-ish distinct commands that Vim, that I can express very cleanly to Vim, and I only had to memorize 30 things. And let's be clear, that memorization, memorization is a strong word. If I want to delete something, I have to remember D. That's very easy. If I want to delete inner word, IW, it all, I don't even consider it memorization at this point. These things just come to my head. I don't translate into them. This just happens. And I've got 2,000 commands at my disposal. Uh, this is pretty incredible to me. Um, so this is actually a pretty common theme. A lot of people have talked about this idea. It's uh, I've got links here to a number of blog posts. This is one called Learning Vim as a Language by Ben McCormick that describes kind of his approach to learning and how he got that much more value out of Vim when he started to think about it as this language and this grammar for describing changes. Uh, similarly, the Carbon 5 blog has a wonderful post on text objects, the definitive guide, which, like mine, is a very lofty title, but they do a great job of covering uh, most of the text objects that there are. Uh, this is another post, Why Adam Can't Replace Vim, and it talks about the history of Emacs and Vim and what they each got right, and the fact that editors like Sublime and Adam have really followed in Emacs's path on extensibility and configurability, uh, and kind of missed the boat on the whole composability thing, those 2,000 commands that I just described that Vim has. Uh, not a lot of editors have copied that, and mostly they just call themselves Vim clones because they want to stay close to the title. Um, Similarly, this is a great post uh, from usevim.com called Stop the Configuration Madness uh, that's suggesting just a real focus on this core part of Vim, this uh, language for defining changes. Uh, and particularly, it has this great quote, you know what improves productivity? Mastering motions and operators. And I would agree with that. Uh, I've found the most value in this as something that I've kind of worked on within my usage of Vim. Lastly, there is the classic canonical text, which is uh, Stack Overflow Answer called Your Problem with Vim is You Don't Grok V or VI. Uh, and this talks about Vim is VI improved. But that great stuff, that core, that language for editing text comes from VI. Uh, and this post goes into surprising detail for a Stack Overflow post on what that means, what this language is, how do we build up commands, uh, and how do we use them most efficiently. Uh, so if you've not read this one in particular, I would highly suggest it. But all of those posts are pretty great. And we'll give you a little bit more information on uh, you know, this style of working with Vim, which is kind of the core style of working with Vim. So now, my tips for mastering the Vim language. Uh, the first is the dot command. The dot command is that thing that lets you repeat a change. So I try as much as possible these days to think about my changes in light of the dot command. Would dot be able to repeat the change that I'm trying to make? If not, I've probably done something wrong, because Vim has this very expressive language. And if I cannot express my change in it, it's probably me, not Vim, that is limited. Um, so an example of this is try to use text objects over motions. So text object being inner word versus W word being a motion. And as an example here, if I happen to be on the beginning of the word result, and I say change word hello, if I come down to this second instance of the word results and I repeat it, it's actually moving forward through the word. It's a motion forward. It's not defining a region of text. Whereas if I instead, even if I'm at the beginning, change inner word, hello, and then I'm here in the middle, that repeats. And it repeats on anything that Vim considers a word from anywhere in that thing that Vim considers a word. So uh, I almost never use motions unless I have to. Uh, for instance, I. I don't think I've ever used W as the way to define a change. It's always change in a word, mostly because of that light shining moment that happened in my history where I discovered it, but also because those changes are more repeatable. They're more 
uh, expressive of actually what you're trying to do. Similarly, uh, let's see, prefer text objects. Yeah, that's definitely that. Uh, Repeat.vim is a plugin that you can use that extends this idea out to more and more things. So it allows other plugins to opt into repeatability uh, and allows you to repeat a lot more things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to uh, otherwise. This is by T Pope, and there's a link here, so you can use that uh, if you're interested. Additionally, relative number. Uh, who here uses relative number? All right, that's most everybody. For those that don't, maybe this will convince you. Uh, relative number is an absolutely amazing feature. It's a relatively new feature, like two-ish years old, which in Vim's 40-year history, depending on how you count, that's new. Uh, and it allows uh, for line-based editing in a very intuitive way. So I'm gonna slide a little bit further out of the way. You can see the numbers over here on the side. With relative number turned off, we get the absolute line number. Uh, so as I move around, nothing changes. And say I wanted to change from result down to complicated. So I wanna like kind of combine these two. I don't really have a good way to do that. Let's see, it's 15 minus nine, that's six-ish. I only know that because I had relative number on earlier. Uh, so I can get that, but I had to do math. And again, the whole point of Vim is I don't wanna think. I certainly don't wanna do math. Uh, so relative number, if I turn that back on, will actually show me the exact number of lines. So if I move back up to where I started there, we can see six, and again, that's really the only reason I knew the answer to that question. And now the question of how do I change from here down to complicated, will my eyes follow down to complicated, move out to the side, see the number six, and then it's change six J, change six down. Uh, this is unbelievably useful, I use this many, many times a day. I'm not actually sure how I got around in Vim without it. I'm also not sure how it took Vim so long to introduce this as a feature. Uh, as an addition here, you can see that I actually have the absolute line number. Uh, this is a even more recent feature that was added so that you can have the best of both worlds, essentially. The current line is given the absolute line number and all relative lines off of that are given their relative value, uh, which is pretty amazing. A Little bit tricky for pairing, but you know, if you, Go to line five, four, three, two. You have to kind of chase your pair. Uh, but I find that that comes up rarely enough and uh, is easily worked around. This is absolutely worth it. So definitely check out relative number if you're not using it now. Uh, and that just allows you to target lines in a much more meaningful way. Lastly, visual mode is a smell. I mean this in the programming sense of the term smell. Uh, it's an indication that something might not be right. Uh, so coming back to the language metaphor, don't use two sentences where one will do. Uh, with visual mode, you type one change, one operation, one command, which is visually select something, then you make your change. Uh, you can usually express that in just a single change operation, a single command, uh, and in fact, by doing two, you actually break repeatability. So if I'm here on this word and I say B-I-W, I've now visually selected, it doesn't really show up on the projector, but the word result is highlighted, Say change, type in hello. If I come down to this word results and I hit dot, that doesn't repeat. It, it's not the same operation. It didn't get that whole thing. Whereas again, change in a word, hello, come down here, dot, that does repeat. Uh, and it's actually very rare that Vim does not have the expressiveness to target what you're looking at. Uh, this is definitely true of lines. If you're using capital V visual mode where you're selecting whole lines, relative numbers got you covered. Absolutely. If you're working within a line and you just don't have another way to express it, then sure, visual mode can be a tool. Um, but again, I, I, the word smell feels right to me here. It's an indication that there might be a better way. Uh, so be mindful of that. Look at when you're using visual mode and say, wait, uh, could I do this a different way? That's a great way to continually kind of up your game with text objects uh, and the whole Vim language. So now we get into the fun stuff. Uh, the Vim language is amazing. What comes out of the box, if you're remoting into a server and you're running with bare Vim, is surprisingly expressive. Uh, but it turns out that there are more things that we might wanna do. Uh, so these are a number of plugins. I'm gonna move pretty quickly through them, but I'll give you a quick idea of what each of them do. They all act as the verb in a Vim command, but allow you to do something unique. So we'll start with surround, uh, T-Pope plugin, as so many are. Uh, and surround lets you delete, change, and add surrounding things. Uh, so to demonstrate this, if I have this quoted text here, I can delete surrounding ds quote. ds is delete surrounding, that's the operation. 
double quote is what I'm targeting. That's my object, if you will. I can also change surrounding, CS. CS, double quote, single quote. So change surrounding, target the double quotes, change them into single quotes. Uh, I can even add surrounding. So if I come up here to the word results, YS, there's no good way to say add a surrounding. Uh, YSIW, double quote. Surround the inner word with double quotes. And again, because of all of the magic of vim and repeat.vim, this is repeatable. I can move somewhere else and I can repeat that operation of adding a surrounding character, uh, which is pretty magical. This even works uh, with tags. So here I'm inside of a p tag. Say I wanted to change that to an h2. Change surrounding tag, h2, and there we go. Which, again, blew my mind. T Pope, you do some good work. Uh, so that's surround.vim. Uh, next we have commentary, another tpope original. Uh, this one is for commenting out content. So here we're in a Ruby file. Comments in Ruby are uh, denoted with a hash sign at the beginning of the line. So I could type that in, but that's not fun. So cml comments over the given line. L just means to the left, but because a comment is a line-wise operation, comment out this whole thing. Uh, I can also go down, so to say cmj, that targets down a line. Uh, I can target the entire paragraph, cmip. So this gives me an operation to comment things. Uh, and it also works in reverse, so cmip there will uncomment. So I can toggle comments on and off, again, with that same expressive language that Vim gives us for everything else. Replace with register. Uh, if I were to copy the word, so yank inner word to get that word into my clipboard, I now have the word results, and I want to change the word calculate into results, and I happen to be in the middle of it. Typically, the way you would do this is VIW to visually select the word and then paste. Uh, but that's boring and not repeatable and not expressive enough. Uh, so there is a plugin called replace with register uh, that uses GR, go replace. There's only so many keys, so we have to get fancy with some of these. GRIW will replace the inner word. And that, again, is repeatable in the same way that anything else is. Uh, this also can work with a given register. So Vim has lots of clipboards. And you can say, use this clipboard, or that clipboard, or that clipboard. Uh, so again, it expands that language even further. Next, uh, actually a few that I've built up, because this is something, again, that I've been really getting into within Vim. Uh, so here, I'm inside of a string. Say I wanted to title case. So capitalize the first letter of all of the words. I can say GTI single quote. And I can now uh, title case inside of that string. Uh, I can do the same thing for, uh, let's see the whole paragraph. Why not? Nope. Not total GT. Here we go. Uh, leader GT IP. That capitalizes the whole paragraph. This is especially useful in prose. I read a lot of markdown, so title casing a line works out really well for me. Less useful on a Ruby paragraph, but you get the idea. <clears throat> Next, uh, sort motion. This is one for sorting. Uh, contents is especially useful in something like a gem file. If your company says we should keep everything in alphabetical order, that's really tedious to do by hand. Uh, Vim does have a sort operation that you can use on a visual selection, but again, I don't want to use a visual selection. So here I've mapped this to GS, go sort. GS, IP, will sort the inner paragraph. So that actually, you can see what it's doing there. So it's taking them all and sorting them into alphabetical order. Uh, very useful for things like gem files or other require statements or anything that you want to keep in alphabetical order. And last, system copy. Uh, I like to keep my Vim and system clipboards separate. Some people connect them, but I find that gets really noisy, especially uh, because I actually use a utility here which keeps track of my clipboard, the last 50 entries, and I make use of that pretty extensively. So if everything I copied or deleted in Vim went into that, it would just destroy this history. Uh, but now that means I have an operation, CP, in my case, for copy, and I can target anything. So uh, CPI single quotes will put can can strong parameters there into my clipboard, or CPIP for copy inside this paragraph. And now I have everything from there inside of my clipboard. Uh, so again, just giving me that same expressive language uh, for operations that wouldn't have it otherwise. Uh, again, these are all plugins that are linked here, and I'll have the show notes available. Show notes, the talk notes, that's what this is. Uh, so similar to the verbs, you can actually make custom nouns, custom text objects. Uh, these are a few that I actually happen to use, and we'll see a few more in a minute. But again, just to give a quick summary of what these are, uh, 
The first is indent. So if I jump down here into one of these groups, I don't really have a good way to target these lines. If I happen to be at the top, it's very easy using relative number to target them. But what if I'm in the middle? I can certainly see a distinct body of text there, uh, but I can't describe it to Vim, at least not before the indent text object. Uh, so that is ii, and I can use it with any of those changes that I talked about before. So cmii will comment the inner indent. And again, this has the same wonderful repeatability. Well, something went interesting there, but it did repeat it. Uh, so I can repeat that across. And similar to inner indent, I can also have an indent, which is basically any text at the same indentation delimited by a greater indentation. So here, if they happen to be separated by new lines, I can still say CMAI, and that will comment out all of them. And again, I can delete those, I can change those, I can indent, I can dedent, uh, I can target them and do anything I want to them. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, entire, this one comes up surprisingly often for me. I just want to target the whole document. I want to operate on the entire document. So for instance, CMAE, comment an entire thing. DAE, delete an entire thing. Uh, all of these, I now have a way to describe. I now have a language that's repeatable and undoable. All of those wonderful things that we've talked about so far. Uh, line, another one that surprised me how useful I have found it. So if I come down here to the word uh, gem coffee rails, again, don't really have a good way to describe the text starting from the G all the way out to the end. But it turns out that's often what we care about in a line. We don't care about that beginning white space. Uh, so what I can do here is I can change uh, inner line, C I L, and now that puts me into change mode, and I can repeat that. Not sure why I lost that, but thing. So there are some edge cases, but uh, I'm actually surprised. I've never seen that before. Cool, that's what happens when you give a talk. Uh, but inner line and A line, A line being including the text but not the new line at the end, uh, is actually extremely useful as well. And a final one, Ruby block. So this is one that is syntax aware. It understands the language that you're operating on. Uh, so here we have a couple of different Ruby methods. I'm able to target this first one very easily if I want to comment it out, say CMIP, because this happens to be a paragraph in Vim's understanding of the world. But if I come down here and I try and repeat that same change, CMIP targets everything not separated by a distinct line. Uh, that's not what I mean. I mean a Ruby block. Uh, so uh, Drew Neal has actually built up a plugin that allows me to target a Ruby block. CMAR, AR being that new text object, targets a Ruby block, which is pretty cool. Has the same repeatability, same undoability, all of those great things. Uh, so again, that 2000 number that I told you about in the beginning, which was a conservative estimate, has now just blown up. I've put new things on each side. I didn't do the calculation, but it grew by a lot. Uh, and most importantly, it grew by the things that I care about. Vim continues to speak my language. I don't have to speak its language. Uh, and so this extension of the Vim language I find extremely powerful or empowering, I guess is the right way to put it, and extremely useful to me. Um, so again, I have all of the links to those. <clears throat> excuse me, to those. Uh, in addition, on the uh, wiki for the custom text object, there's kind of a base plugin that others build on top of. There's a whole list of all of the other ones. Uh, this was written by the wonderful Kana, who does amazing, amazing Vim plugin work, just kind of overwhelming. Um, but so there's all of these, and you can check out there are ones custom to specific language. If you're a JavaScript developer, you can get a function related one. Most anything you'd need uh, is in here. <clears throat> so that about wraps it up for me. Uh, in conclusion, my feeling is that having a composable language for operations and text objects it's one honking great idea. Let's do more of those. Uh, so those are my feelings. Do we have any questions? Anything you guys want me to clarify? That's a lot of talking for no questions, really. Today. Uh, the surrounding operation mm -hmm. seems to be common enough for programmers. How hard is it to, to include that into the, into the Vim language? As, like, as much as we mm -hmm. got the relative number recently, how easy or hard or Right. Uh, so the question, just to repeat it for the audience at home, uh, surround.vim is an example of a plugin that many, many people use and seems common enough that it might be worth pushing that upstream into Vim proper. Uh, so 
I cannot answer that directly, uh, whether or not that's something that they're looking at or how difficult that would be. I know that there's a certain kind of boundary in that Vim is written in C and surround is written in Vim script, which are very different languages. Um, fundamentally, it's certainly something that they could add, but I think there's kind of an ideal around Vim that let's not change too much. So uh, thing has had 40 years to grow, and a lot of people would say, let's add nothing to it. I know many people that actually run with no syntax highlighting, with no plugins, just core Vim, uh, and they probably would be opposed to that kind of change. That said, NeoVim is an example of the community saying, no, no, let's, let's keep growing. Um, so again, I can't answer for certain as to whether it's something they're looking at or how easy it would be, um, but my guess is core Vim for a little while is gonna say, that seems to be working fine in a plugin, we'll leave that to the external ecosystem and keep core Vim more focused. That would be my guess. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys very much. Happy to talk about this after, and thank you for coming out to the Vim Meetup, and have a good night, everybody.